Hi, I'm Samuel McCallum. I'm the producer and editor for Flywheel. You've probably heard me in some of the content that we posted directly to YouTube, but if you've just been listening to the podcast, you probably haven't heard me yet. But I've been in the Frax community for a long time, pretty much since actually since day one. I was there on day one with Frax, and I really love this ecosystem. I love stable coins and I love how money works. So let me ask you a simple question. What is money? Is is money dirty, unbacked fiat that's losing its value every day? I don't know. Maybe it is. Is money the global reserve currency that every country either holds or uses or either issues through their central banks? Sure. Yeah. Is money something that you have in your bank account? Well, yeah, that's too. And what about the dollar-based stable coins like Frax or USDC or Tether or, or DAI that exist solely on crypto networks? But yeah, that's money as well too. So in every case we have money, and in all the forms that I mentioned, it's, it's dollars, right? And, but they come in many different forms, right, these dollars. They're digital, they're physical. There's a ton of different types. And so it may be a little bit confusing to think of them all as dollars. We just kind of do it. We just kind of say like, uh, USDC is the same as money in my bank account, which is the same as the money that the central bank issues to big banks. It's all the same in our heads, but it's not really. I mean, there's, there's real differences between all these money. And the th thing that is different between them is the strength of their money claim. Yes, a money claim. Because if you have a dollar or something that's dollar-like, the only thing that you can really say of it, right, is, is how strong its money claim are. So we usually d define money in terms of its functional aspects. So we say that you know money has, is a unit of account. It's a store of value. It's a medium of exchange. But this doesn't really take into account the core feature of, of what money is. And that feature is that it always, or at least it should always, trade at par on demand. So at par just means at face value. So if you have a dollar in cash, you should be able to take it to your bank and exchange it for a, a dollar in your bank account, right? You know, it'd be really weird if you like went to McDonald's and you would just, you just went to your bank and you'd taken out $20. And then you go to McDonald's and you order a burger and fries and a milkshake and whatever. And you take out your $20 bill and you give it to the, the cashier and you're like, hey, here's 20 bucks. And they're like, oh, you know, we just decided today that we're not going to take cash anymore, or at least we're not going to take cash at par anymore. Uh, you're going to have to pay a tax on the cash to actually use it. So now this dollar that you have is no longer a dollar. It's like 95 cents. So we have a different menu for our cash users than we do for our non-cash users. And you can take it over here. Well, that would be really weird, wouldn't it? Uh, there's actually laws that, that force businesses to take cash uh, at, at value, right? There's no way that businesses can, can charge more for you to take their cash. But essentially what the business is doing here is they're saying it's, it's too hard for us to hold cash or it's too expensive. So it really just doesn't make sense. We're just going to go cashless. Now that's not cool, right? You, you want to be able to have the ability to use your paper dollars anywhere you go. If, if you couldn't, then they just wouldn't be worth any, they wouldn't be worth as much anymore. I mean, maybe instead of a dollar, they're worth again, like 95 cents. And we would probably just stop using it at that point because who wants to get 95 cents of value when taking a dollar's worth of money out of the bank, right? So the main job of a central bank is to ensure that the money claims, like in this paper dollar or the ones that are in your bank account, are strong and that they preserve over time. Because if they, if they weren't, you probably lose faith in the money system faster than you could swap into like Bitcoin or gold or something else where, you know, one Bitcoin always equals one Bitcoin or like one kilo of gold always equals one kilo of gold, right? A good analogy, at least in the crypto ecosystem, is that back when Luna was functioning, UST was, it was functioning, People really thought that the UST, that they were swapping their dollars or whatever into, they're getting UST, they're putting it into Anchor, and they're making a nice yield on their money. And they thought, oh, hey, 
this UST is a dollar and it's always going to be worth a dollar. So I have this like strong money claim where if I swap my, my dollars into UST, I'm going to have the ability to swap that out for one dollar's worth of value at a later point. Well, how wrong were they? I mean, if they really knew, if you really knew how much UST was going to be affected or how much danger there was in UST, what would you actually price it at? I mean, I wouldn't actually price it at a dollar or, you know, I'd want interest rates a lot higher than 20%. So there was a mispricing of UST because people didn't understand how strong its money claims were. Because UST's money claims were that, oh, hey, if I have one UST, I can swap into $1 worth of Luna. But if $1, if $1 worth of Luna is constantly going down in value, well, then I may not have that, that $1 worth of Luna. It may be worth a lot less. So the Luna that everybody, or the UST that everybody had and was holding and making these crazy interest rates on, it didn't actually have the money claim to $1 that it said it did. People were saying that it did, but when you got down to brass tacks and the whole thing went to implode, there was no guarantee from anybody that UST should actually have its value. And it quickly went to, you know, a couple of, a couple of cents and, and died and everybody got completely horribly wrecked. So when we think about money, money is just a money claim at its core. And the person with the strongest money claim or the entity with the strongest money claim is the sovereign government. It's the U.S. Treasury. It's the central banks who hold the power to issue as much money as they want, right? It's kind of a taboo. So the reason that the sovereign has to have this ability to print as much money as possible is that in, in order to, for it to maintain the confidence in the peg of, let's just say, the dollar, the U.S. government has to have the ability to print as many dollars as it wants uh, to then put into money markets or banks or whatever uh, that, are, that may be having issues at the time. And this is what happened in 2008, right? So the real estate market blew up. It caused global contagion all across the world the global banking system essentially stopped functioning because nobody was going to lend to each other and there's a lot of mispricing of assets uh, and the money markets just failed. I mean, this was the, the dollar money markets where you could swap dollars back and forth or different money-like claims. They just, they just froze. And so governments around the world had to come in and bail out the global banking system because if they didn't, the whole thing just would have probably collapsed and then the economy would have gone into a much, much worse uh, recession or even depression or who knows what there would have been a lot more there would have been a lot more pain there would have been a lot more pain and so this ability for the government to print as much money as it wants it's it's called a put it's just simply a hedge against loss or in in this case losing par which famously happened in 2008 in the money markets so the government had to step in, bail out the banks, and restore confidence in, in essentially the dollar, the, the peg, the par of the dollar, uh, or the value of the dollar at par, its face value, in all of the institutions that it has. So this is the biggest difference between UST and the government, where the government can always say, oh, hey, we're always going to value this at par. But if you have money in UST, which is further away from the government, its money claims are weaker. You may not always have the ability to swap $1 back into a dollar. So the further that you get away from the government, the weaker your money claims get. And there's a bunch of different types of, of, of puts, right, that the uh, different institutions have, right? Uh, so even though you may be getting further away by putting your money into a, a bank, because money in a bank is just a, a credit, it's just a, a debt that the bank owes you, the bank works with the government to provide FDI insurance that insures your accounts up to $250,000. This is also a put. But if you go further and further away, let's just say you go all the way out, and now you're talking about something like Tether in the crypto markets. What is Tether's put, right? So say they have, I think they have 70 or maybe $100 billion worth of Tether today. Uh, if it was found out that there's some issue with the reserves that Tether's holding, and the peg breaks, who's actually there to, to make sure that, that the value of Tether stays at par to $1? You know, who's going to step in? I, I don't think it's really known, right? Uh, 
maybe it's somebody, maybe somebody has a hundred billion dollars or a couple billion dollars to, to back this up, but it's really opaque. It's not transparent. And it's, it's not clear about, about how that money claim, if you hold one tether, it's not clear about how that money claim is always going to be both verifiable and then actionable to take your one tether and put it into one dollar. So what does this mean for Frax, right? If if Frax is further away, right? So if you think about like the government issues money, you have institutions like Circle, which then can take in like T bills and T notes. It issues USDC. That USDC is a is a claim on uh, the cash that that Circle holds, plus the other instruments that it has to make a little bit of money, like those T notes and T bills. If if Frax is a claim on USDC, which is a claim on those T bills which are then issued by the government. That, that seems a little bit removed, right? That FRAX somehow has less of a money claim than the USDC or, or most notably the T-bills. And that's, that's okay, right? So it's a necessary thing for FRAX to be further away because it's on a crypto network. And it's okay that, that FRAX takes in all this USDC. So there's been a lot of questions about, you know, uh, can Frax hold a peg if USDC is going to come in and ban it? I, after this whole tornado cash thing, I, I just don't see that, right? There's there's a clear path of all the deposits that people are holding of Frax. Uh, and, you know, you can you can have your your claims strong all the way through. Uh, but the thing about Frax is that you know, this, this simple system, which I described, where, you know, Frax is, just holds USDC and the USDC is a claim on the T-bills held by Circle. Um, that was just how things worked up until the end of V1. With, with V2 of Frax, you now have AMOs, which take the, the treasury funds, in this case USDC, and then it spreads it out across all the different money markets and lending protocols and pretty much everything in, in DeFi uh, to diversify out of USDC. So now Frax owns a ton of different stable coins. They own DAI and Tether and they own um, some other ones as well too. And the interesting thing about this is that when you take your USDC and you put it into a, a three-party AMM-like curve, you now no longer have exposure just to USDC. You have exposure to Tether and I and USDC. Uh, so the risk is then mitigated because of those one actors. So what are Frax's money claims? Well, this is interesting, right? And it's something that no other crypto protocol has. Even DAI, right? Even DAI has this because they've actually taken money off chain, the reserves off chain, which is no longer verifiable anymore about what's happening to this. With Frax, every single dollar that backs up Frax is visible, it's analyzable, it's verifiable at every single block, at any single time, at every moment of Frax's existence. So you can go back to the first, first block of Frax all the way up to now and see a block by block uh, analysis of all the reserve assets that are making up Frax at any one time. Everything is on chain. It's always been on chain and there's no plans to take it off chain. So this means that you can build really cool systems to go out and do some deep analysis on Frax. You can come back and you can say, okay, this is the core makeup of all the assets that make up the Frax treasury now. Uh, USDC, DAI, Tether, everything. We can, we can put that into a list. We can quantify it. Uh, and then we can have an exact, exact list of how much money is owned at every single block and then piece together a broader risk perspective of holding those assets. And this is cool. I mean, this, this is what makes Frax the strongest stablecoin in the entire crypto ecosystem is that it has the ability to go off and do this. I mean, you, you can't do this at higher levels, right? So this is something that like central banks and banks don't even have. Like all the money that a bank holds, uh, all the money the central bank holds as well too, or issues. It's all really opaque. It just goes into the banking system. Each bank can see what their deposits and loans are. And maybe the central bank has a better understanding of what's happening at those banks. But it 
can't see everything, right? So every single piece of, every single dollar that's ever been created is not visible to the Central Bank of the United States. If, if some dollars are created in Argentina or if they're created in Japan, the Central Banks don't see those. But with FRAX, every single FRAX that's in circulation is visible and it's verifiable to know that that FRAX being held in Ave has the same backing as the FRAX in Curve or in Uniswap or any of the other different DeFi protocols. This is what makes FRAX so strong. And this is what makes Frax's money claim stronger than anything else. You can know that if you have $1 of Frax, you're going to be able to get $1 worth of USDC back or whatever kind of asset you want to get. And this is always going to be the case. You know, from day one, Frax has made it its mission to say that the, the peg for Frax must be held no matter what. If you look at other crypto stable coins like DAI, or even Tether or some of the other ones, uh, they've lost the peg. They've, they've, there's been points where uh, Tether has lost confidence in, in investors and it's traded below a dollar. And with DAI, because of the way that it works, there's times where its value actually went the other way, where it, you know one DAI was worth like a buck twenty. And so these different incentives and mechanisms give these different stable coins the this this volatility that they shouldn't have but with frax we don't have this it's it's mathematically impossible to break the peg and the peg is always going to stay put because of the way that we have designed these amos most famously the curve amo when we ask ourselves the question about what money is at the end of this episode it's really very clear that frax has the strongest money claims in the entire crypto ecosystem because its entire reserves are verifiable, they're transparent, and they can be analyzed at every single point of its existence from start to now, and will continue to be. And that's, that's cool. That's really cool. So money claims are the most important thing when it comes to being a stable coin. And this is going to lead us into our next episode where we're going to still talk about money again. Before we even talk about stable coins, we need to spend some more time on understanding what money is. What are the different forms of money? You know, I've talked about money being a stable coin and also being something that you hold in the bank. In the next episode, we're going to perf- In the next episode, we're going to analyze a taxonomy of money to understand all the different variants. And a taxonomy is essentially just a categorization. So let's define all the different types of categories that we can apply to money to then understand all the different types of money that we use. Is it digital? Is it physical? These types of of characterizations. We're going to put them in opposition to each other and then map out all the different ways and all the different characteristics that money has. And once we do that, then we can go forward and say, oh, hey, we're going to talk about stable coins, which are exactly this. So next time on the next episode, we're going to find out what stable coins are through taxonomy of money. I want to thank you for tuning into this episode. It's been really nice to have you all here. This is going to be distributed through our regular channel on the podcast just for this episode. But all the further episodes that we're going to be doing about this education and analysis and asking questions about like what is money and you know, what are the characteristics of money? And then get deeper into Frax itself. This is all going to be published through being a member on Substack. Uh, we're going to use that as the primary way of distributing to our, our group, the, the Flywheel group. So if you haven't signed up already, please come to the Flywheel Substack and sign up and be a member. It's completely free. There's never going to be any charges. We just want to have a way to communicate with you uh, that's not twitter or telegram so uh, you just have to come in you plug in your email and then we can send you cool emails like this where we'll be talking more about like what money is so yeah come on over to substack the link is going to be in the show notes we're going to publish it on twitter as well too and you can sign up and get a ton of great premium content delivered right to your email address on a consistent basis so thanks so much for tuning into this episode i am samuel mccullough and i will see you in the next one